Each day, police and citizens file warrants against suspects for offenses ranging from running a red light to assault and battery. With most of the police officers' time spent working on criminal cases, there's little time left over to serve warrants, so the warrant backlog continues to grow. City Police Officer Major John Wilson says thousands of warrants are piling up because of the problem. What the problem is, knowing we have uh, 7,000 warrants now on backlog, and it grows at about 1,000 a year, and we used to have a warrant car assigned to it. These are misdemeanor warrants. The car would go out and serve the warrants. Because of the manpower shortage, this car has been put back into the ranks of patrol. One of the possible solutions that we have considered is listing all of the uh, people's name and address that we have outstanding warrants on in the local paper. While police officials search for a solution to the backlog, more warrants are being filed every day. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA-TV News reporting. The Federation for Decency wants the public to take a hard line against what they call respectable pornography, magazines that for the most part are sold legally over the counter to millions of people. To be able to prosecute, to say that it's legally obscene, I'm certain you couldn't get uh, a playboy prosecuted as legally obscene. But in terms of what it does to the community, we believe the selling of it, the marketing of it, is a crime against our community. Federation leaders believe this sort of material may actually be more damaging than overt obscenity. They say it contains a subtle message of immorality that's also present in many TV shows. You're teaching them that intimacy outside of marriage is not a sin. Well, I don't think it is. That there is a market for it we believe is, is not a reason for it to be in our communities. An obscure fact that emerged in today's seminar, there are a lot more televisions in this country than bathtubs. Still, if these people have their way, a lot more people will be cleaning up their acts soon. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News. Some other place, like the folks here, you're from the city. So we're glad you came. We'd like to The selling of pornographic magazines is a crime against the community by the seller of the pornographic magazines. That's where we are. Now, to be able to prosecute, to say that it's legally obscene, I'm certain you couldn't get uh, a Playboy prosecuted as legally obscene. But in terms of what it does to the community, we believe the selling of it, the marketing of it, is a crime against our community. Members of the League of Women Voters were briefed today on how to look for and to some extent how to stop possible voting violations. But Helen Moore from the Secretary of State's office says Alabama's voting laws are too general and unclear as to what can and can't be done. She says her department can't run a smooth election if they can't determine just who is eligible to vote. I think that no one will feel very comfortable with the elections as they are run in the state of Alabama until the lists are cleaned up and we feel secure that a person cannot be registered on more than one list at a time. Recent U.S. Justice Department rulings now allow a person who has registered but whose name doesn't appear on the registration list to vote a challenge ballot. That means the vote will count only if the registration is verified. Also, a handicapped voter can now pick a person to help in the voting box instead of the polling officials doing it for him. These changes have league members concerned. And we'd like to see a really, really good polling procedure this time and the good education of the polling workers. Dean Argo, WSFA, TV News. The first thing that's going to happen, the Sheriff's Department will hire six new female deputies. Then the department has agreed that one out of every three people hired should be a woman, until 25% of all deputy sheriff positions are held by women. The Sheriff's Department has six months to develop a way to hire and promote deputies that doesn't discriminate against women. The department has agreed to aggressively recruit women for deputy jobs. In hiring, military experience isn't supposed to be an automatic plus anymore. 
and applicants can't be asked about their sexual history. The settlement takes care of a lot of the complaints about so-called women's work in the sheriff's department, namely that the female deputies got stuck doing jail duty and that female deputies were kept from patrol work until just last summer. Deputies can no longer be assigned work on the basis of gender. While newcomers generally get jail duty, transfers from the jail are to be based on seniority. And female deputies are to compete on an equal basis for the patrol or field jobs. Susan Silvernail, WSFA TV News. Troy is currently under the commission form of government, but some want to change that to a mayor-council government. That issue is supposed to come up for a vote on October 23rd, but the vote may be postponed. A suit has been filed in federal court to stop the referendum, and Mayor Jimmy Lunsford is upset. The referendum on Tuesday allows our people a choice. We can decide our destiny. We can continue to progress. We do not have to let the federal courts decide our future. An attorney for the plaintiff says the referendum will cause confusion. The October 23rd vote is a city issue and voters will have to go to municipal polling places. During the November 6th general election, voters will go to county polling places and that, he says, isn't fair to his mainly poor black clients. It seems to me that that is asking for maximum confusion, especially on the part of voters whom I represent, which are the black registered voters of the city, who have less access to transportation, fewer phones in their home, less resources, less education, and are most vulnerable to confusion in this particular circumstance. Burnham says they want the city to either postpone the referendum until after the November 6th general election or to have Troy citizens vote at county polling places. As for the commissioners, they plan to hold the vote on October 23rd as planned. Terry Stanton, WSFA TV News, Troy. The Secretary of State's office says at least 175,000 new voters have signed up this year, as many as three times the number signed up in any other given presidential year when voter interest peaks. The power to control your destiny. The power is your right to vote. Commercials like these have been responsible for some of the increase, as well as the frequent visits by the candidates and the continued efforts of other nonpartisan groups like the League of Women Voters. But the individual parties have taken on new strength in voter registration. As of our latest count, which would have been almost two weeks ago, uh, we estimate around 175,000. Democratic Party Executive Director Al Lapeer admits that some of the 175,000 are voters registered through other groups and local deputy registrars, a method that does not screen partisanship. So Republican Party Executive Director Marty Connor says Lapeer may be registering many Republicans as well. But the Republicans have a poor registration record in the past, a record that is changing. Uh, Jesse Jackson, he has been running about the countryside, basically advocating anti-Reagan uh, and anti-Republican. Uh, and we had to do it. That's led to a sophisticated computer-assisted search for just unregistered Republican voters, and Connors says there are many of them. Like, but I would guesstimate a strong 39,000 Reagan voters who've been able to register since, since approximately April of this year. One point both sides agree on is registering new voters is one thing. Getting them to the polls on Election Day is another. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News.
Thank you. Congratulations to Odessa and Starla, and thank you to everybody who performed out here. Let's give them all a round of applause. You know, they'll be plugging at you and plugging at you, and all of a sudden he'll just break one. Of course, you saw that last year. So uh, he's gonna have, we're going to have to bring him down. He's supposed to be their uh, Heisman Trophy candidate, in which, you know, he might might only deserve to be a candidate, you know, from what I've seen, some of the film. And he, uh, it'll be a definite, it'll be one of our biggest challenges just keep him in, keep him on the ground. They're going to make some yards, and, and they're going to score some points probably. It's just a matter of uh, keeping them out of the end zone uh, as many times as possible. And I think, uh, you know, I think our defense has come around to where we've got some confidence built up from last week. But, hey, last week was last week. This week is another week, and we're playing a great offensive football team. There is some turnover in major league managers. And if you don't play well and you don't win and you don't draw people, there are all kind of reasons why a manager can be replaced. And, and uh, that was incentive enough for me to at least try to do a good job. The real, the real incentive, of course, comes on the part of the players. They went out and, and hit and scored runs and pitched well. Coach Mack Woods Elba Tigers finished 8 and 2 a year ago losing to Eufaula in the state playoff. After a 5 and 0 start this season, the 4A Tigers were virtually assured of another playoff berth, but still went out and beat a very good 6A Carroll team, 14 to 13, which up their mark to 6 and 0 and led to their number 1 ranking. We really had to get ready because they were so big, they're 6A and we're 4A. Plus we knew it meant a lot if we beat them. He really helped our season now. Senior quarterback John Hudson was spotlighted for his performance in the Tigers' 33-24 win over state-ranked Pike County. But last week, running back Michael Scott provided much of the Tiger offense with 140 yards on the ground. Michael is awfully quick, has got good moves, and a tremendous big heart. He's not very big, but he's got a big heart, and he runs hard all the time. The Tiger defense has allowed just 57 points in six games. Head Hunter Ken Ware leads the Elba defensive charge from his linebacking spot. It's like everybody keep hitting and hitting, you know, and making the big plays come up. Something really happened. These drills are all too familiar for the Elba High Tigers as they prepare for Friday night's opponent, Charles Henderson. Unable to schedule but eight games, the Tigers will be playing the 5A Trojans for the second time this year. They've had some tough luck. They've played some good football. Uh, they've not been able to win, but we expect an awfully tough game from them. The Alba High Tigers, our high school team of the week.
Lieutenant Ted Payne says Lucas is connected to the disappearance and murder of Joan Gilmore, a 46-year-old librarian who disappeared in 1978. Two and a half years later, her skeletal remains were found in a wooded area outside of Greenville. This investigation developed last week when two of our agents of Alabama Bureau of Investigation and the, of the Department of Public Safety, working with the Texas Rangers, spent many hours interviewing Henry Lee Lucas. The investigation is continuing. There are still many questions to be answered in the Gilmore case. For example, in 1982, a man told police that during the time of the investigation, he would picked up a teenage hitchhiker with bloodstained clothing near the spot where Mrs. Gilmore's body had been found. Lucas, now 48, couldn't have fit that description. And while the investigation in the Gilmore case continues, the investigation into another murder mystery is coming to a close. Lucas has confessed to the slaying of Bernice Harris, a Millbrook woman whose body was found in a gravel pit near Prattville in 1980. Elmore County Assistant District Attorney Janice Williams says while they have the confession, it may take them a while to get Lucas to Alabama to face any charges. I said that the Elmore County Grand Jury will meet in January, and we intend to indict him or present this case for indictment at that time. But as far as when we'll be able to get him back here, we're just going to have to get in line behind all the other states that want him. Lieutenant Payne says his department has connected Lucas with only two murders in Alabama. But he and other law enforcement officials say they're certain that Lucas is involved in many other unsolved murders. Terry Stanton, WSFA TV News. because she never prepared. And it was a temporary emotional setback, obviously, in, in this, uh, but of course in the past I've, I've been able to recoup and go forward and, and uh, of course I, I have mixed emotion, obviously. I, I'm glad that they do have a viable suspect and, and, and I think in the long run it'll be more peace of mind to me that that uh, the case is, well, not closed, but at least it's farther along than it's been in the past. Today's news conference increased Gilmore's hope that one day someone would be arrested for murdering his wife. I have mixed emotion, obviously. I, I'm glad that they do have a viable suspect in, in and I think in the long run, it'll be more peace of mind to me. That Gilmore, who remarried almost three years ago, is a man who's been trying to get on with his life. But new developments in the case, including today's news, keeps reminding him of the past. It seems like it never ends, and, and it's, such, I guess, so much more difficult to put behind you than, say, just a death in the family, which you accept and go on. The Gilmore murder was one that always raised more questions than answers. And while Gilmore didn't want to relive the past by asking lots of questions, there is one answer he wanted. I guess that was really the question is how much, you know, how much uh, she went through. While Gilmore would like his wife's murderer prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law, he says he's not vindictive and he doesn't see how anyone could live with both hate and grief. Don Phelps, WSFA TV News. board members like to come in. Would we? Yes, that we had. Again, no cost, volunteer by Air Force instructors in their off-duty time and using our, perhaps in 
helping the young people in the computer literacy and uh, helping in the total program that you have here. The greatest shall become. We hope we're just helping to plant a few acorns and that we'll see some oaks grow. We're happy we're able to help. There are 3,500 AME Zion churches in the U.S. Worldwide, the denomination is one and a half million members strong. In 1980, newly elected Bishop Cecil Bishop was assigned to West Africa. This past August, he was reassigned to the U.S., specifically our area. Bishop says there are many similarities between here and there, and one big difference. Everybody there is black, and so racism is not a real problem, as it is in this country. Where the bishop says his church makes no blanket political endorsements, but takes a pragmatic approach to the voting booth. What we try to do, what I try to do as a spiritual leader of these people, is to point to the issues that are before us and to uh, sensitize the constituency to the point where they would go and vote their conscience and vote for the candidate that would best address the issues that are pressing upon them and that are critical to their survival. Bishop Bishop says world hunger, racism, peace, unemployment, and the disintegration of the family are major issues his church needs to address. And he says it cannot be done from an ivory tower. Lynn Sampson, WSFA TV News. The priorities uh, cited on were set, on, set forth by the local PTA legislative committee and they recommended that additional funding for special education be the first priority. Secondly would be uh, reducing the ratio for kindergarten and thirdly the additional teaching materials, attention to textbooks, and uh, refurbishing of facilities. I have mixed emotion, obviously. I, I'm glad that they do have a viable suspect, and, and, and I think in the long run it will be more peace of mind to me. But I guess that was really the question is how much, you know, how much uh, she went through. said to the committee up there that he tells every employee that he represents the law was unconstitutional. First of all, we got to put more teeth in our law to enforce it out here and get every employee in the state of Alabama that should be covered, covered, because that's what's happening right now. There's a lot of employees out here that's working every day that not, doesn't have the coverage of workman's comp benefits because, like I say, there are a lot of employers out there operating outside the law right now. 
this committee, uh, Chamber of Commerce, Associated Industries, and people like this, and they sit down at the table and they negotiate. developed last week when two of our agents of Alabama Bureau of Investigation Wimp Sanderson has averaged 20 wins a season in four years as Alabama's head basketball coach. But if the tide is to win 20 again this season, several questions will have to be answered on the floor. We're going to have to find some depth, especially up front. We need to get some rebounding going. We need to be a little bit more consistent defensively. Uh, we have a very young backcourt. Sophomore Terry Connor, who saw action in 28 games as a freshman, may replace Eric Richardson at point guard. Oral Roberts transfer Mike Godfrey, who sat out all of last year, is the leading candidate to replace Terry Williams as the tied shooting guard or zone buster. You know, I think if teams start to slack off and go in there and, and uh, guard Bobby Lee and Buck, that you know, I'm confident enough that I can hit it. Forward Buck Johnson, Alabama's leading scorer a year ago with a 17-point average and center Bobby Lee Hurt, give the Tide one of the best one-two punches inside in the entire SEC. Now that the Twin Towers and the bread truck have turned pro, Hurt may be the premier center in the league. I think we can be good as we want to be. You know, I think we all go out and play good and play as a team, play together. We can win. Alabama's pre-conference schedule includes Maryland and possibly Virginia. Dave Cody, WSFA TV Sports. Well, this is down to a one-game season. If we win, we in the state playoffs. If we don't, we're not. It's that simple. Stopping Prattville won't be simple. If the Poets are to make their first playoff appearance in six years, they'll have to keep the ball away from a Prattville offense that is piled up yardage en route to a 6-1 and one record in number five ranking. They got some real quick backs, and they have a good quarterback on offense, and then they have some good kids on defense. A big McCall kid's an outstanding player, and they have a real good free safety. The Lion defense, though, gave up 270 yards passing last week. The Poets are a wishbone team, but they like to throw. Quarterback Stanley Murray has two of the city's top receivers in Anthony McCall and Patrick Fenderson. I think Stanley's done a good job for us, and we got some receivers that can catch it. So we're just going to stay with our game plan. Game time tonight, 7.30 at Crampton Bowl. Dave Cody, WSFA TV Sport. An unusual thing is happening at Notre Dame Stadium this fall. The fans are booing the home team. 
For the fourth consecutive year, a Jerry Faust coach Notre Dame football team is struggling. Faust is not surprised by the negative reaction of the fans. When we play the way we play, you know, you can expect that stuff. You know, we haven't uh, played that well, and, and uh, you can expect that stuff. Uh, if I was sitting in the stands, if I knew what was going on in the field and how the kids were doing things like that, then I wouldn't do it. You know, but they're not down there. And they don't know the inside problems. Faust and his players face another stiff test Saturday when undefeated South Carolina visits Notre Dame Stadium. Irish followers hope for the best, but fear the worst. In South Bend, Jack Nolan for NBC News. Sonny Smith's biggest concern as his Auburn Tigers begin practice is finding a replacement for the SEC's Player of the Year, Charles Barkley. The big intimidator is now wearing a Philadelphia 76 uniform. Chuck Person, an alternate on the Olympic team, will be Auburn's big gun. I'm not going to try to um, overbear myself with the load of scoring and rebound. I'm just going to try to do the same things that I I did last year, but just do them a little better. Sonny Smith hopes a half dozen talented freshmen will progress fast enough to make the Tigers a contender once the SEC season begins. Well, I think our new guys are all very good. The only problem is they're untested, and, and uh, the way freshmen react to this league, you never know how they're going to do. But I, I think Chris Morris is a very good freshman. I think, um, I think uh, Jeff Moore is a very good freshman. Two people capable of stepping in and playing immediately. I think Terrence Howard is, is ready to play at guard on, on skill alone. But I think the real surprise for us at this point has been uh, uh, Darren Guess. Darren Guess has, uh, is powerful. He shoots the ball better than we thought he could. And he really is doing a good job for us in, in just all around play.
Hayes International, the Birmingham Aircraft Refurbishing Company, and its salvage operations supervisor, Lewis Beasley, were also charged with conspiracy, but the jury found both not guilty on that related charge. The conviction comes two years after state environmental officials found barrels of highly flammable paint waste in a residential area of Goodwater, Alabama. The investigation turned into a federal state operation. The people from EPA, primarily investigators Cole and Mundrick, have done an excellent job on this case. and. Uh, Really, without them, it would have never been possible. But I'm, I'm very glad that the thing came about because uh, it, it does show a lot of hard work, and it's something that's needed, and it's justified, in my opinion. Certainly, it, it helps a program that uh, is fairly young, the uh, Criminal Environmental Enforcement Program that uh, both the Justice Department and uh, 
EPA have been trying to develop, especially over the last two years. Charges against two of the defendants, V.O. Abrams and David Smith, were dropped by federal judge Robert Varner. We sincerely uh, think that the court held us too, too stiff of a, of a standard in, in the case. And of course, we could not meet the standard as to Smith and Abrams that the court interpreted the law as requiring. And Both Hayes International and Beasley face up to $400,000 in fines each, and Beasley could go to prison for up to 16 years. What about a possible appeal? Well, now it's not a, a, no decision has been made. Now it's not really an appropriate time to comment. We're evaluating um, the situation, and uh, no decision has been made. Judge Varner did not set a sentencing date for Hayes or Beasley. He'll also have to set a date for sentencing of Lyndall Bolton and his company, Performance Advantage Petroleum. Bolton and his company pled guilty several weeks ago to similar charges of violating federal hazardous waste laws. One other defendant, Ray Kelly of Goodwater, Alabama, is still at large. He hasn't been seen since last July when federal authorities arrested him in Tampa, Florida. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News. I have no quarrel with that as far as violent crimes are concerned. I do question the, the reasonableness of that as far as nonviolent crimes are concerned. Well, I can see the day when we're going to have to have a nursing home operated in the prison system. If we're going to keep them for life, uh, then of course we're going to have to have a nursing home. Question the laws. We want a mild and weak administration of it. We want it both ways. And I submit to you that any time you have a law on the books uh, and you convict a man, yes, that the, that the ultimate answer to our problem is that Shake that dirt off a little more. You can see that. There you go. seven or eight years of age. Another brother down at another time, one was all he could handle. But it's a party mainly. It's a festival, which is what we say it is. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. It would not have lived if those things that I've said were not true, spirit. And uh, the feeling that we want to we want to celebrate. We want to put on a party, build around the peanut. We owe that peanut a lot. I know of a town right now that has everything to We had a mayor's milking contest about getting uh, Clemizel. Uh,
And I think when a young person is pregnant with a child, they need to be aware of the dangers of drinking during pregnancy, the hazards of smoking during pregnancy, and also the proper nutrition during pregnancy, so that they can be assured of, of delivering a healthy infant.
we're gonna have to work out a lot of things during the week to, uh, you know, to help us, you know, and the receivers to, to communicate with each other, and because uh, there's, there's no way we're gonna be able to hear each other. There's no way I'll be able to hear an audible uh, split out wide. But as far as the snap count and everything goes, I'm just mainly looking at the ball and moving on the ball. We'll have some signals or something, so the receivers will be able to pick up when we're audibleizing. Back there, band is right directly behind our bench, and it probably and it probably plays only when we have the football and. Uh, you know, those type of things, but uh, to be totally prepared for it, someone that's never been there, you can't. Prattville scored its winning points on quarterback Chris Turner's six-yard run in the second overtime period. It was Turner's third touchdown of the game. Lanier had a chance to tie, but on fourth down, halfback Roderick Bikes pass to Al Harris fell incomplete. And the Lions came away from Crampton Bowl with a 31-24 playoff clinching victory. If ever there was a game that could match last night's game for excitement, it would have to be tonight's intercity clash between Lee and Jeff Davis. No playoff berth on the line, just bragging rights. Uh, once again, it boils down to a matter of pride, uh, you know, having to live with your neighbors. We say that all the time, but uh, it, it's uh, maybe true in some cases more than others, and I think maybe this is one of them. This one has all the makings for an offensive show. Jeff Davis quarterback Mike Fike has thrown for more than 200 yards in each of the last two games. Watching him on film is probably the best high school passing quarterback I've seen since Scott Hunter. We're going to have to put pressure on him and be able to stop him and those receivers if we've got a chance to win. The generals are averaging well over 200 yards a game on the ground, largely due to tailback Bobby Washington, who's averaging 130 yards an outing and who has scored 12 touchdowns. They don't turn the football over, and they control the football, which is something we're very much concerned about. The battle for the bragging rights begins at 7.30. Dave Cody, WSFA TV Sports. At the start of the 84 season, Kyle Collins and Ed Graham didn't expect to see much action. Both Collins and Graham could have been superstars at a small college, but both of them decided to come to Auburn, and things have worked out well. The Tennessee game marked the emergence of Collins, who transferred to Auburn from Jacksonville State two years ago. With Bo Jackson out for the season with a shoulder injury, the junior halfback from Gadsden scored three touchdowns en route to UPI Southeast Back of the Week honors. Well, it started off awful slow for me personally, and uh, as the season progressed and things worked out the way they did, you know, I just felt like, you know, God was really blessing me a lot in what he was doing in my life. And, uh, you know, when Tennessee game came around and I scored three touchdowns, it was a very overwhelming experience, a very humbling experience that, uh, that occurred for me. And each time I go out, you know, I'm just trying to do my job, and I just want to, you know, help the team out a little bit every time I go out. But it's very exciting for me, and I, I'm telling you, it's uh, something that I never expected. Graham's biggest moment thus far occurred in last Saturday night's win over Florida State when he scored a touchdown on a fumbled second-half kickoff. The senior from Bayou Labatra, Alabama, is enjoying his time in the spotlight as well as Collins. Yeah, it's um, really been a fulfilling year, especially watching him play. And I know it's meant a lot to him and it's meant a whole lot to me getting out there and uh, playing and being a part of a victory instead of just, you know, standing on the sidelines. Uh, I love, you know, playing here at Auburn and I'd do anything, but it just it's real fulfilling and satisfying to get out there and play. The 1984 season is going well for the Tigers now and one two former walk-ons will never forget. From the athletic department, Mike Hubbard for Auburn Tiger football. A low scoring game tonight at Conrad B. Henderson Stadium rivals Stanhope Elmore and Wetumpka. The first score of the night came with 522 left in the first quarter. The Indians number 43 Stanley Smoke got the score. 
The point after was good and Wetumpka led 7-0. The Mustangs failed on the fourth down play late in the second quarter. The Indians ran the ball down inside the 20 when David McKee intercepted a Keith Peavy pass. And a few plays later, the only score for Stanhope came from Stanley Crawford, who rambles in from 43 yards out. The game was tied at the half 7-7. Seven seven. The lone score in the second half was again Stanley Smoke for the Indians. The senior fullback lost his shoe on the carry. With a minute 19 left in the third quarter, it was 14-7. The Mustangs would threaten late in the game, but an interception ended the drive. The final with Tumka 14, Stanhope Elmore 7. Jim Jackson, WSFA TV Sports. I've often referred to their offense as a track meet because they have such fine players and they've got great speed over there at the wide receiver spots and uh, Johnny Jones, of course. Well, when they gave him the ball, the opposition turned go, go. Johnny was going just fine until an injured shoulder slowed him against Auburn, but he still leads the SEC in rushing, averaging better than 136 yards a game. Quarterback Tony Robinson has completed 59 of 96 passes in four games. With speedy Tim McGee, the SEC's leading pass catcher on the receiving, and the Vols are a real threat offensively. They have given up uh, quite a few yards and points uh, on their defensive side of the football. We're going to have to uh, capitalize on the uh, different blitzes and the things they do. Uh, they give away a lot of things, and we're going to have to take advantage of them. The kicking game is as much a part of Tennessee football history as General Nealon himself. Jimmy Colquitt and Floyd Revez do the kicking. McGee and company do the returning. I feel like Tennessee does have a great kicking game, and they have a lot of speed at that position and everything. And I feel like um, we will work hard, and we we'll, should be able to stop it. It's going to be a rowdy one. It always is at Neyland Stadium. They get 95,000 fans up there, and most of them are in orange, and uh, it's going to be pretty wild. I'm, I'm excited about it. If you travel Montgomery's Eastern Boulevard very much, you've seen a lot of this going on lately. New cars and trucks being unloaded. Several years ago, it was more of a gamble to stock many new cars, particularly when gas was more expensive and interest rates were skyrocketing. That led many people to the foreign car market. But Capital Chevrolet General Sales Manager Jack Fowler says things are different now. The foreign car market had us there for a few years, but I feel like that General Motors has updated their plants. They're using robots in their factories now to build a better quality car. Fowler says sales for the past two years have been good. That would lead you to believe that sales may be leveling off across the street where Johnny Garland sells Toyotas. Sir, sure, right now it's not. Uh, you know, as long as we can get X number of cars, uh, we're going to hold our, our portion of the market and we hope to get more of the market. Garland says they worry more about trying to keep enough cars in stock. Lamar May is looking for a new car, the first new car he's bought in 14 years. Lamar has been buying used cars. The economy, to me, seems to be a little bit better. I'm not quite as afraid as I was a few years ago, so I'm, I'm looking at new cars again. And Lamar may represent a possible shift in what car buyers are worried about. Lamar's last car was an economy car when he was more concerned with gas mileage. But now... Probably number one would be price, uh, and second would be the size of the vehicle, mm -hmm. with uh, gas mileage on down third or fourth, somewhere along in there. And all of this isn't to imply that Bob Youngblood and his colleagues in the used car business are losing customers. We haven't seen any change in our trend as far as used cars, numbers-wise. Mm -hmm. uh, we find that we're selling about as many automobiles as we were uh, two years ago. What they've all essentially said is that when interest rates were high, both new and used car sales were down. Now that the economy has reduced the price of money, both are doing better. The only car market that never really knew there was any crunch was the luxury car market. 
The sales of $25,000 to $40,000 cars at Jack Ingram never really slowed down, and they're still selling more Mercedes than they can keep in stock. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA-TV News.